So, uh, welcome. Can you hear me? Is it okay? Yeah. Welcome to Barcelona and this uh, specific uh, speech. Um, well, we are going to talk. Uh, well, my, na my name is Chay Farras. I'm the moderator of this uh, session. I'm the dean of a small university in Central Catalonia, University of Vic. And uh, we are going to talk about basically how technology can transform cities. Can we, how can we manage cities in base of disruptive technology that, that are emerging now? You know, uh, big data, IoT, uh, artificial intelligence, and so on. And uh, well, basically, in order to know for you the, the rules of the session, um, every one of the speakers, I will present them very briefly because I only have two minutes to do that. Uh, we'll have four minutes in a kind of elevator pitch format to present the basic ideas they want to transmit to you. Afterwards, we'll have about 10 minutes uh, for their 10 speakers, so we'll stay for 40 minutes, more or less. And afterwards, we'll have uh, 10 minutes for questions and answers. You, you have to do that through your uh, applications in the mobile phone. And finally, I will have the list of the questions that I will transmit to the um, uh, speakers. Uh, for each one of the speakers, uh, they only have four minutes, so I will, I will raise a red banner when they consume three minutes, and they will have only one minute more in order to uh, summarize the main ideas. Now let's go to present, it's my pleasure to present very briefly each one of the speakers. Uh, we have here Ms. Athena Vakali from the Aristotle University. Uh, she's professor of the IT department at Aristotle University in Greece. And she leads online source analytics on web and internet distributed platforms research group. Uh, we have also we have the pleasure to have Stefan, uh, well, I don't know where they are, but they are in front of me, Stefan Trutain, that is the CEO of HHP Berlin, a company focusing in next generation fire engineering. We also have Mr. Alan Work from Sightintel in Estonia. He, uh, he is the CEO and co-founder, and he's going to explain to us some things about the uh, next IoT revolution. We also have the pleasure to have here Mr. Beiko Raime uh, from Mobilab, CEO of uh, Mobilab, also in Estonia. Dr. Hugo Zaragoza, uh, who is a recognized researcher in machine learning. He's the co-founder and CEO of WebSays, a startup pioneering online opinion analytics. He's going to explain us something about social media's best, senior, uh, best sensor network for your city. Also, Dr. Josep Paradells from here, from Catalonia, I2 Cat, uh, who is professor of the Polytechnical University of Catalonia and director of I2 Cat, that is a leading research center in internet in Catalonia. Uh, John Manrique, instead of the original uh, speaker, that was David Ruana. John is CTO of Build District, Te Build District Technology, that is a company focused on augmented reality. Mr. Bartolome Crespi, from the smart office uh, of the City Council of Palma de Mallorca in the Balearic Island. Mr. Piero Pelizzaro, who comes from Milan, uh, with a lot of experience in climate change applications. Uh, he will explain us the main achievements in the Sharing Cities project about climate change in Milan. And finally, from the other side of the Atlantic, Mr. Greg Seralo, uh, who is the co-founder and president of Sidekick Interactive, a mobile app agency in Montreal. He will talk something about uh, how to snow removal through mob mobile applications in Montreal. So uh, let's go with the, first, with the first speaker. Athena, please come here. Thank you very much. And the floor is you. Thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to, to be here. Uh, the presentations, Javier, are already in here? Yes, yeah, should be the presentation, please. Uh. Yes, OK. okay. Uh, we are here to present uh, the what we call uh, Vol for All, uh, coming from the world's volunteering for all. It's a platform that we have developed uh, at our university. Uh, our goal was to drive innovation and citizens' empowerment, and uh, we have developed a prototype uh, motivated by the fact that uh, actually there is a misconnection between uh, those who assign the volunteer and tasks and those who would like to participate. 
uh, and there is a lot of fragmentation and volunteering efforts. Uh, this is very evident in Greece right now because uh, of the crisis. There are a lot of issues which demand people's participation. And uh, for this reason, uh, we have developed an interactive, uh, user-friendly friendly online platform uh, with an easy-to-use interface, with an obvious timeline, uh, highlights, and uh, also with gamification practices and analytics. Uh, in our platform, uh, we have uh, certain processes both for the organizations and the participants, the users, the volunteers. Uh, the, the organizations can uh, declare the tasks they would like to uh, have volunteering effort for. Uh, they approve the participation, they actually award uh, participation and they evaluate it afterwards. And the volunteers at the similar pace, they create their profiles. They have a calendar of displays and they are awarded in a gamification-like uh, manner in order to gain credit, uh, which can then, uh, uh, let's say, share with others or they can uh, get certain awards. Uh, analytics are also support per timeline, per region, and uh, we find this is very useful uh, because the analytics highlight uh, the reasons for volunteering per region and this can motivate uh, certain innovation in particular regions. Uh, so far, uh, we have implemented the prototype of the platform in the city of Thessaloniki. It is the second largest city in Greece. Uh, our university is the largest um, in Greece. And uh, we have noticed that uh, the visualization effort that we have carried out is evaluated very positively by the user so far. Uh, accessing is also supported on the mobile applications uh, that uh, complement, let's say, the, the main platform. Uh, because uh, the users and the volunteers, as they walk by the, the city, they can have uh, certain notifications in terms of the volunteering tasks that took place in the, in the surrounding area. So, as I said, uh, the awareness is increased and also our goal is not just to have the platform but to encourage the participation and the innovation and also the market in an effort to identify which are uh, the markets uh, that could be activated uh, by our platform. Uh, we can certainly see the citizens, we can see the city authorities, the urban planners, uh, the urban innovation plans. As I said, um, in the case of uh, Greece and the crisis, this becomes really helpful. Uh, we have so far uh, in embarked in the platform used some uh, local uh, citizen activists, some gr grassroots activities, uh, like the one you can see the logos uh, on, the, on the slide. Uh, and we have so far uh, received prototype rem uh, rem uh, positive remarks for the prototype. And uh, in our group, uh, we are uh, going on uh, in uh, having uh, better analytics, uh, which will cover more the authority side. And we also work in our group with big data and IoT uh, data analytics. Uh, some information, of course, can be found in our website. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you very you, much, Javier. just in time. Athena, thank you. Uh, it's your turn. Stefan, thank you. That's oh, okay, perfect, thank you. I start. Okay. Hello, um, my name is Stefan Truthen. I'm Chief Executive Officer of HHP Berlin, and I will tell you a little bit about our smarter approach for secure smart cities. So, w what we see in the, in, the, uh, in, in the coming years is that this is not a crisis when in uh, cities more and more of these things uh, start. So digitization, pop-up stores, flash mobs, mobility, all these things are not crises. At the end of the day, the world is uh, uh, changed, it's agility. Well, what it means for the security, uh, the, the security uh, organizations. In the next uh, 30 years, more and more uh, buildings were produced, uh, more than in the last 3,000 years. Um, but one thing is the same over the last 100,000 years. The temperature of the fire is the same everywhere in the world. So our approach is we bring all the three important facts for the Secure Smart City together. Uh, the first thing is organizations, fire departments, police stations, uh, they uh, work not for alone. They react on events. 
examples like fires or disasters or crisis, but mostly uh, in, a, in a special place, on, on buildings or on places. But um, they react proactive or reactive on these events, and the most time they ra raise or lower the risk. For example, today, the, the power outage that uh, uh, raise a little bit the, the, the risk in these buildings. And at the end of the day, this has an influence of the, uh, of, the, of the organizations for the resources or for the engines. We bring all these three parties together in one holistic approach, we named it uh, uh, ONE. And uh, the, the idea is that we not uh, uh, store the data, we store the results between the different data silos. What we see is a rise uh, of more and more apps, and at the end of the day, we have more data and nobody has to control about it or understand what is possible with it. So, one example, um, this uh, paper plane, so find it in a hotel room or uh, uh, in 20 years, when you talk with your child and, the, and have a question, say, what was paper? Uh, what was paper? But the interesting fact is, what was uh, the A4 format? And then I realized, at the end of the day, a PDF on a tablet is only thinner and lighter, not, not smarter. And we, HHB Berlin, we emancipate all the data on the paper and bring it on a platform as an example to show what's possible uh, when we democratize the access to this data. For example, the hydrant. And when I use my smartphone and walk uh, outside of a fire engine, maybe I, uh, I can switch my smartphone and I see the symbols inside of the system. So when a firefighter or a policeman came to a scene, he have a smarter uh, approach. He can say, hey, that's this predictive maintenance or machine learning. The hydrant is not working. Go 10 meters left. Uh, this is a reducing of the incident, incident time and, and maybe that helped to save lives. Uh, we have more uh, s scenarios uh, they based on this platform. This gives an opportunity for the others to understand that we are not a, a, a data silo again, so we more a meta platform, a clue to bring all the different uh, organizations together, all the information of the, in the future of uh, intelligent buildings. So how can we collect this data? individually and then we, we can share the results to others and, and what is possible when we have all this data in the system. IoT scenarios, maybe the, 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 the building can send the information. Uh, today we have 10,000 uh, people inside of the hall or we have holographic uh, information so that the firefighter or that the police have access to this uh, information and can uh, mark, make smarter decisions. Oh, thank you very much. <laughs> A little bit fast. But, thank uh, you. Thank you very much. You still had... 15 seconds, so thank you. Okay, next. <laughs> now, uh, Mr. Alan Vork, please come here. Thank you. Thank you. It's great to be here. There is a lot of talk about IoT, uh, but how do we understand IoT today? Is that we connect physical things to the, to the internet, to the cloud. We send some information there, we receive back some information to the devices or some commands. However, there will be tens or even hundreds of billions of devices soon connected to the internet. And this will create us a problem. There will be huge amounts of data traffic. This is actually recent numbers, recent prediction from Cisco, how much tra data traffic will be created by those um, small devices. And there is not enough communication channels for this. There will be also created huge amounts of data which has to be stored. And, and there are lack of storage capacity for that. That's another problem with this. So what should we do with IoT? We have to make things smarter. It just doesn't have to be like terminals who connect to the cloud and, and receive commands from the cloud, but rather the devices has to be smarter, like smart cars. They do the data processing by themselves. We also have to connect devices with each other so they can share this information and they can process the information by, uh, by themselves. So it doesn't make sense that your blood pressure monitor sends the information to the cloud and cloud sends the information to your coffee machine how strong coffee it should brew you. They should communicate directly. Coffee machine should be able to decide it by, by itself. Or another example, we cannot, we cannot route the vehicle to vehicle communication through the cloud because of, uh, because of the long, long command send, uh, uh, chain. So before the, uh, before the information comes from the a uh, car driving in front that is braking to the second car, if it goes through the cloud, it takes a long time and crash will be there. So they have to communicate directly. Basically, this is exactly what we have done in our solution. We have brought uh, 
uh, new generation of street, uh, smart street light control to the, uh, to the market where street lights have uh, wireless communication, wireless mesh network, and they can communicate with the sensors. Sensors connect, collect the information from the, from the street about the human presence, uh, traffic flows, um, or other parameters. They share this information to the street lights, and street lights know what to do at this given moment. So when there are not many cars and, and people on the street, they reduce the brightness to save energy. Uh, and when the traffic flows goes up, they go brighter again. And, and this all happens in the, in the local, local, um, local network, so, so there is real edge computing there. So this is what we can call really IoT 2.0, where devices can form this kind of ambient computing network around us, making our life a bit better. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. You still had one minute more, so very, very fast. Thank you. Uh, now it's a, it's a turn of uh, Mr. Belko Raime, from, also from Estonia. Thank you very much. Hello. Uh, glad to be here. Um, my name is Veiko. I come from Estonia Mobile App uh, Design and Development Company for mobile applications. And I'm here to talk about the uh, money design and usability. When, uh, when we talk about the mobile tools, uh, we, uh, we don't control the environment with where it's used. So we don't control what is the light conditions, if, if, uh, if, the if there is rain, uh, if the people, is, people are moving or uh, are they standing on a position. So everybody understands that the mobile user experience and design is very important when it comes to the mobile applications. And that's not any more uh, news to anyone. When we now compare to the uh, compare to solutions for the end users and consumer market, we uh, startup world uh, talks about the uh, lost engagement when it comes to the bad usability. So when the Instagram picture upload is complicated to use, then you uh, then you lose uh, some of the engagement. It might affect your monetary situation. It might not affect your monetary situation. When we talk about the um, uh, the business to business market and the tools that uh, your field workers are using, for example, who uh, need to work there on a mobile, this is not anymore so obvious. So we see that uh, when people, um, uh, when, when the workers are out there on the field, the engagement isn't a problem because they get this paid for using these tools, even if they are complicated to use. So what you actually will lose in this case is the money. Now, um, why is this money not considered so important so far? is I guess because we come from the old world where the paper-based solutions were there. So we haven't actually seen that money yet, which we can win by doing the us usable applications also for the uh, in-house tools and the uh, utility workers, field workers, anyone who needs to be there with the application uh, doing uh, the job while on mobile. Especially complicated it comes when, uh, when there is a combination of the lo geolocation data, there is a location intelligence involved, there is a visu visualization of the mapping data involved, and putting that together with the workflow processes, it makes it uh, rather challenging. So this is where, where we are focusing with our um, solutions and businesses, is that how to make uh, complicated data that needs to be taken out there to the field, let's say the field worker who needs to uh, be, uh, fix the water system, how can they actually see the only needed data for the job in the right time, see it in a, in a way that uh, it can be used as effectively as possible. So we put up, uh, we, took, we took that challenge and, uh, and, and we saw that the big players who actually are doing the uh, information systems like Oracle, IBM, they, they, ha they come from the data world, but it needs to come from the user point of view. So there's a chance to win some money for a lot of utility companies in the world. Uh, to do that, we have partnered up with Carto, actually. So I think together with, the, uh, with a very good company from the mapping world and uh, us from the design world, we make a perfect team. Thank you. Uh, you still had one minute. <laughs> well, OK. <laughs> Sorry. Um, when, I, when I raise the, the banner, is, you still have one minute, OK? Uh, Dr. Hugo Zaragoza, please. Thank you very much. Hello. So I'm here today to tell you that we already have a smart sensor in every city in the world, which is very powerful. Uh, it requires no hardware. It runs uh, on its own. Whether we use it or not, it still is there. And that's social media. 
almost every time a fire starts in a city, we have pictures of it in Instagram before we actually have reports uh, in the police. Uh, almost every time there's a, a social movement, a question, a debate, we have information on the internet uh, before the media picks it up. So we have a very powerful social uh, sensor network, and what it senses is actually our ideas, our emotions, our desires. So it's kind of like having a little sensor by Cisco in your brain emitting all the time uh, gigabytes of information. So why are we not using this more effectively? Well, unfortunately, this data that we have in these networks is very messy data. It's texts, it's people telling each other things, it's pictures, and so there is no nice API. I mean, it's an API to get the data, but how to turn it into useful information, that's actually quite hard, and that's what we're trying to do. So Web 2.0, social media, all of these things uh, not only improved the internet, but it actually brought uh, public opinion digitized. So computers could, for the first time, actually listen to public opinion as a form of data. And that changes the game because we can, once it's digitized, we can run algorithms on it and we can do all kinds of interesting things. And in a way, before, the only brokers we had of information were the media and the government. They decided what was made public, and this disappeared with, with Web 2.0, and we, we all know the results of this. Unfortunately, this data is very tough to use. So let me give you an example. Uh, Barcelona has over 140 official media channels. So these are YouTube videos, uh, YouTube channels, Facebook channels, Twitter channels, 140. And yet, when people want to complain to Barcelona, the number one channel they use is the name of the major. In, when this study was done, it was uh, Xavier Trias, now it's Ada Colau. If the bicycle is broken, you say, hey, Ada Colau, the bicycle is broken. If the uh, garbage system doesn't work, you complain to the major. So you already have a problem is that addressing. We don't even know where to address the data. Even if you were to address it correctly, the second problem you have, of course, is filtering it out, getting the relevant information. So an example, Barcelona again, uh, over 70% of the conversation about Barcelona is actually about the, four, the, the soccer, soccer team. So if you want to know what people are saying about the city, you have to remove all the chat about the actual games, the football games. So you need to do a lot of semantics, classification to clean the data and start seeing something. Otherwise, it's just noise. So another example uh, uh, here is like addressing Barcelona. There's seven Barcelonas in the world. Or there's many more Barcelona cafes, Barcelona bars and clubs. And so you want to, if the major tells you, hey, tell me what they're saying about my city, you have to do a lot of algorithmics to clean the data, separate it, and come up with the right content. And even after you do that, you need to start deciding, okay, what are they talking about? Is it conversation about tourism? Conversation about transportation? Is it conversation about culture? So you have to filter out the conversation because otherwise it's just noise. Once you do all of that work with a sufficiently high quality, with a sufficiently high precision, then you can start getting indicators, statistical indicators, instead of noise. And so now you don't care about the actual words that people issue, what you care about are tables like this which tell you in real time semaphores, KPIs, indicators about people's emotions, people's opinions, people's reactions, etc. And five years ago, years ago we couldn't do this, now we can start to do this because of machine learning technology and the quality that we're getting out of these classifiers. Okay? Uh, some, of the, uh, some of the topics we, you, you know in advance like uh, culture and tourism, but some others come in unexpectedly, so you have to be able to react in real time. So these are the kind of things we do at websites. We can uh, detect in real time unusual events, uh, topics of conversation, and derive different KPIs to integrate into data, into data centers. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. <laughs> OK, uh, Professor Josep Paradells. OK. OK, good morning. Thank you very much for allowing me to be here. I, I just want to, to comment something related to, to the uh, information obtaining, uh, sensing the city, the different ways to do this, and then to comment one, one option that we have uh, followed in, one, in a couple of projects. Okay? We, are, we want to know how the city is, is working. We need, we need to, to get some data, and there are different approaches for doing that. It is possible to deploy a sensor network. It is possible to, to allow, for example, the objects that are moving to get some data. This is something that I will stress at the end of the presentation. It is possible to, to monitor, more or less, as, as Hugo has commented, the, the social media to detect some, some behavior on the city, some issues in the city. 
And also, for example, it is possible nowadays, using the mobile phone mainly, to, to get the collaboration of the citizen in order to get information from, from the city. Uh, the, the, first, the first approach is probably the most traditional, is the one that we have seen in the last in, uh, some years ago, is just to put some sensors in the city in order to collect this data. Okay? It is something that is quite expensive because we have to deploy the, the sensors, we have to maintain, and uh, in, in some cases, and the information that we get with this sensor is some information that is localized. We are able to capture the sensing, capture some events in some localized places. Okay? Uh, it is possible to, to try to use the, the, the activity of the, of the city as a, as a sensor. It is possible, for example, to, to get, for example, the, the tickets in the parking place. It is possible to see, for example, which are the web accesses. And then using this information, we can derive. It is possible to use social media, Twitter, something like that, in, in order to derive some information about the behavior of the city. Okay? This is another option. It is possible also to, to get, to consider the involvement of the citizen in getting information. I don't know, for example, we are using Google Maps. Google Maps is, uses some information of the users in order to complement, to update the information about traffic. So in this way, they see the user, as it is using the application, it is providing some information that can be shared for all the people. Also, there are, for example, some devices that can be used by the, by the citizen and then can share the information among different people. Okay? But basically, what, what I want to, to comment in this talk is basically another approach that we have implemented in a couple of projects is basically, instead of putting the sensors in some isolated places, just to use some mobile vehicles, like, for example, taxi, uh, taxis, uh, buses, or even cars, in order to collect information about the city. In this way, the approach of this it seems quite interesting because the, the bus or the taxi, as it's moving along the city, it is able to capture a lot of information in any part of the city. And also, for example, in states of installation and, and maintenance, is something very easy because we can, we can, for example, uh, we can install and maintain the equipment once the, the equipment is against, for example, on the parking place. And then, in this way, the maintenance installation is quite simple. Okay. In this way, we get a uh, full information of the city, but not in a permanent time, because depending on the location on the object, we can get some information of the other. For example, a couple of examples that we have implemented. One example is, for example, the work that we have done in the, in the, in the, in the, in the, in the framework of the Grow Smarter project. This is a lighthouse project where Barcelona is involved. In this project, we have, for example, developed a, a device that can be put on an electric bike, and this, electric, this device is, in, is intended to, for example, to get some data about the performance on the, uh, on, the, uh, um, on the islands, on the super islands that are being deployed in Barcelona. We're going to, to compare which is the benefit of using this super island. And finally, another object, and, and just to conclude, because I have to finish, then just some remarks. Uh, we, ha we can see that there is a lot of data in all of places. We have to be very careful in preserving the, sorry, <laughs> in preserving the, the, the privacy of the information. Uh, we have to be sure that the information that we get is for the benefit of the citizen. And we, for, uh, for sure, we need to consider big data and data analytics in order to get the correct information, the correct uh, response of the information that we can get. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you very much. OK. It's time for Mr. John Manrique. I, I want to stimulate people to launch uh, questions uh, for the speakers uh, through the application. I think uh, through your mobiles you can do that. So I invite you to, to uh, ask things. <laughs> okay. Hello, everybody. Uh, I will be speaking Spanish. I'm sorry for the people who don't understand me. Um, hola a todos. Um, vengo a hablar de audio realidad aumentada eh, para Smart Cities. La audio realidad aumentada eh, eh, es la técnica que modifica el sonido ambiente real añadiendo pistas de audio que pueden ser tratadas como objetos 3D en la ciudad. Eh, estas pistas de audio son aplicables en muchos campos. Eh, por ejemplo, guías turísticas, eh, juegos interactivos en las ciudades, educación musical y, por supuesto, la integración de personas con limitaciones visuales. Nuestra empresa eh, empezó en el campo de la audio realidad aumentada de la mano de la empresa GN Nord, con quienes colaboramos hace un par de años trabajando con sus auriculares inteligentes. Con ellos desarrollamos eh, esta, esta aplicación llamada Mapeame, 
con la cual explorábamos las posibilidades de eh, la audio realidad aumentada a través de los auriculares inteligentes de, de GN Nord. Mapea era una aplicación que nos permitía eh, geolocalizar sonidos tridimensionalmente alrededor de los usuarios, eh, orientar al usuario con sonido y bueno, usarlo como un poco de información de, de tipo GPS. A partir de esta experiencia con GN Nord, nuestra empresa decide realizar independientemente un desarrollo eh, de aplicación usando los auriculares eh, habituales que todos tenemos, más una interfaz visual. VR, eh, nuestra aplicación, eh, en, es un, en principio es un, eh, tiene un funcionamiento tipo GPS. Este GPS te permite geolocalizar una playlist, la playlist que tengas dentro de tu móvil, y dirigirte a, a cualquier lugar de la ciudad siguiendo las indicaciones de audio. Con esto quiero decir que con esta aplicación eh, puedes llevar el, el móvil guardado y cuando te salgas de la ruta, el sonido te indicará que está, que está a la derecha o a la izquierda eh, y que te debes dirigir, ¿no? VR es, la primera, es, la primer, es el primer demo de nuestro trabajo. Con VR eh, queremos eh, crear una, una capa que nos permita agregar capas de, de sonido inteligente sobre un eh, plano GPS, sobre un mapa, e ir teniendo allí guías interactivas eh, donde los usuarios puedan encontrar información e inteligente en audio de las ciudades. Eh, en conclusión, el sonido inteligente abre nuevas posibilidades de interacción en las ciudades, sobre todo para la integración de personas con discapacidad o para el disfrute de actividades culturales. Bidistrict cuenta con la experiencia en el desarrollo de, de, de ese tipo de, de eh, aplicaciones. Nuestra tecnología ahora solo usa los auriculares corrientes que todos tenemos cada día eh, dentro, de nuestro, dentro de nuestro staff de productos ¿no? y permite sumergirse dentro de esa experiencia de eh, eh, realidad aumentada en las ciudades. Ese es el equipo de Bit District y pues muchas gracias. ¿eh? Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Bartolomé Crespi, from uh, the smart office, uh, the smart office of the City Council of Palma de Mallorca. Buenos días a todos. Bueno, voy a, voy a explicar eh, la, las oportunidades que, que tiene una ciudad cuando está en proceso de, de transformación de, del destino. Para que os hagáis una idea, estas son los, la, las ciudades como centro de datos. Son uno de los pequeños eh, datos, que, los datos que genera la ciudad. Eh, realmente, si os, eh, si, os, si os echáis un vistazo por aquí, eh, el, el destino de la ciudad inteligente ya existe. Simplemente hay que norm, eh, normalizar esa tendencia tecnológica e eh, incluirla dentro de, de, de la, del sistema de funcionamiento de la ciudad. ¿Para qué? Para poder generar realmente la inteligencia del destino de la ciudad a través de la explotación de, de, de los datos. Una pequeña evolución que hemos estado haciendo en Palma para transformarnos en, en destino y ciudad inteligente. Ahí veis toda una serie de pasos. La más importante es eh, generar los ladrillos digitales para, para la transformación de la ciudad. Y ahí tenemos... Eh, Ahí tenemos el, el proyecto de Smart Wi-Fi Playa de Palma, que luego se ha extrapolado hacia la, la ciudad de Palma. Eh, bueno, y, 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 y ahí un, un poco de motivación pa, para, para los que estamos en este tema. ¿no? Eh, llevamos años trabajando y uno de los principales proyectos ha sido la eh, implantación de Wi-Fi en toda la Playa de Palma. Una, una infraestructura que nos permite captar cuál es el comportamiento y el uso que hace el turista en el destino. ¿no? En, en las tres fases nos centramos en la, en la fase del medio. Ahí tenemos fotos de, de, la, de la instalación. Y luego eh, aquí tenemos toda una plataforma que representa el centro de datos de, del uso de, digital del destino. ¿no? Eh, para que os hagáis una idea, Solo, solo eh, esta temporada turística hemos eh, hecho unos, eh, unos 8 millones de identificación de dispositivos solamente en la playa. Bueno, tengo un vídeo que no da tiempo. Eh, para que os hagáis un, una idea, aquí tenemos la explotación de, de esos datos, pero en formato eh, muy, muy básico, sin, sin entrar en, en el kit de la cuestión. 
y eh, vemos las posibilidades de conocer qué está haciendo el turista en el destino. ¿Cuál es el objetivo? El objetivo es dotar de wifi a toda la ciudad de, de, de Palma. Ya hemos empezado eh, por la playa de Palma y continuamos con todo el centro de, de Palma. ¿Esto qué representa? Realmente representa una, una oportunidad eh, eh, real de, de, de identificar el turista como, como un ciudadano, como un sensor ¿no? y realmente hacer eh, predecir su comportamiento, qué está haciendo en el destino, en, qué, en, qué, en dónde nos encontramos en la captura de datos. Eh, hemos hecho un despliegue de infraestructura pero nos hemos quedado ahí en, el, en el, la captación de datos y no en la explotación. Eh, ¿Cuál es nuestro objetivo final? Es mm, dotar de una eh, herramienta, una plataforma en la ciudad que pueda, eh, que se especialice en la explotación de esos datos. Las tres conclusiones y acabo. Normalizar las tendencias tecnológicas en el desarrollo de las ciudades y destinos inteligentes. No queremos más pilotos, la tecnología está madura, muchas tecnologías están maduras, por lo que necesitamos ya implantaciones reales y eh, soluciones a, a problemas que tenemos. Y el Big Data y la ingente cantidad de, de datos que genera la ciudad como modelo predictivo del comportamiento y como una inteligencia real de la ciudad. Gracias. Okay, thank you very much. I appreciate the respect for the time. Uh, now it's the turn of Mr. Piero Pellizzaro from the municipality of Milan. Okay, I'm going to speak in Italian. No, I'm joking. I'm not speaking in Italian. It's, uh, as my presentation, maybe it's the Prezi presentation, so in the main while, well, we can start. Otherwise, no problem, we can start anyway. Okay, it's the city of Milan. We are the city of Milan, and during the last five years, we have invested so many effort to get all of your technology, all your company in our cities. And what is supposed to be there, but what I'm telling is a storytelling, so that's more easier. What we got, uh, during the last five years, we have retrofit more than 22,000 square meters, abundant uh, public uh, buildings, to invest on incubators and startups. We have now 680 startup company in the city of Milan. We have 11 uh, incubators on, on that, well, let's say. Well, I go straight. And, and from that, we have specialized um, also the city. Let's go back to the city here. Ahead. And so we are also in, within this uh, space, we have testing new business model for social impact startup. Because what we are going funding, what we are funding is not only company and make it profit for business. This is part of the game, guys, but we also look and try to get social profit and social inclusion as part of the, and social innovation as part of our funding scheme for, for the startup. So one of that is the Fab Labs that are helping people gain access to labor market. We have uh, creating this WeMake. With the WeMake, we have more than 150, uh, uh, six, oh, sorry, 46 co-working spaces dedicated for the Fab Lab and 150 people were normally engaged, net people were engaged in a couple of months since we launched the WeMake uh, in this process. But at the same time, uh, the Urban Landscape of Innovation Hub, what is the urban regeneration, what was I saying? This is part of the process to recover in the city and give the city a new perspective. We are not only the fashion and design city anymore, we also are one of the running, uh, the leading city on the sharing economy. And that's also part of the presentation that has come. Because one of the other ways is the sharing economy. It's sharing economy is a mix of the tools we have. We have the community, when we talk about sharing and smart, Smart is not only about technology, it's not only about infrastructure, it's about communities. And what we consider smart and, and sharing for us is the social street, for example. And the social street is using a platform, it's, a, it's not a platform, it's a, an informal platform. So it's a normal groups or Google or WhatsApp or something to manage public services or to integrate and support and to share what is their needs and, and, and things. At the same time, we as a city, we are a neighbor of uh, a platform, it's named E015, the platform was launched last year during the expo. This is try in the long term, one in the long term, in the next year, we will help to interoperability of the different data set that we have in the city. The city of Milan has 254 apps, all your kind. We have more than New York, so we are bigger than New York in this sense, only for that. But, so this is something that will be help at the E015 to improve and to work on more closer. Um, what is the governance and procession innovation is part of the sharing at the gain on the sharing cities and the sharing vision that we have. Uh, so we have a teach pay and the food policy is a platform where all the cities, all stakeholders could create and move on uh, after the expo that we got um, last year. 
Um, on this, what, with all this part, is because Milano is always uh, seen as a city that is changing process. Uh, we always be the economic development is part of that, and we are looking to have you on Milan uh, for the future, uh, and we are helping, looking for new opportunity in the, around the globe. So thank you very much. Thank you. And now the last uh, speech from Mr. Gregory Serralo uh, from uh, Quebec. I must say that um, his project has been selected as one of the projects to opt to the final as one of the best for the awards in the project category here in the Smart City Expo. So congratulations. Thank we you. Expect to have good luck in the final. Thank you. Okay, so uh, I'm Gregory Serralo, uh, co-founder of Psychic Interactive. We're a mobile app uh, development agency in Montreal, Canada. Um, cities all around the world all have their own unique challenges. And these are different because all cities have different sizes, different history, different cultures, so many factors that that differentiate these. But they mostly attack the problems in the same way. They gather data, they use tools inside uh, the organization to uh, solve these problems. And when they're um, faced with how do we share that data with the citizens, they're stuck in a way that's really tough for them to do. We believe that the only tool right now that can easily help diffu uh, disseminate, visualize, and communicate with citizens is mobile apps. And in my presentation, I'm gonna show you the three ways, the three secrets that we use to make sure that we create the highest quality mobile apps that really get results. So the unique problem that we would have uh, in Montreal is uh, winter and moreover snow. So this is um, a typical day uh, after a snowstorm in Montreal. And you can imagine the difficulty that citizens have in finding parking one. And two, when the snow removal operation comes, um, the cars need to be removed from the city in order to be able to clean the streets. And if not, then the cars happen to be towed or, uh, or par uh, get a parking ticket. So for the citizens, the knowledge of the whereabouts of the operation is very, very valuable. The city on its side has been really working on making the snow removal operation lean, more um, creating software in-house for them to manage it. But when it comes to sharing that data, what they do is they give an open data portal. And I'm not gonna show you the data because there's something like 500,000 data points that are updated in real time. So for a citizen, it's really tough to be able to use that to its advantage. So we created a solution that builds on top of the strengths of mobile apps. Uh, the mobile app that we created um, basically uses the three pillars that we use to, to make sure that we have high quality. So the first one is simplicity in both uh, design and the user experience. We've done that by grabbing the information and putting it on the map, visual. There's very few options in the app. Less is more in terms of apps that you give to citizens. You can get more information if you select a point. The, the second really important thing when creating a mobile app um, for citizens is to make sure that the information they get is contextual and it's personalized for them. So you get context by giving them, by using their GPS position and giving them the information around them. And you get it personalized by allowing them to select favorites so that they can say, oh, I, I'm really interested in these five streets and I want to get the status of those streets in real time right away. And the final thing, which has to do with personalization, is the fact that the mobile app is the only tool that you have right now at your disposal that allows you to push information to users. So sending a push notification where we get the user to say where he's parked, and then we triangulate that with all the data, and we're able to send him a personalized push when the time comes for him to move his car so that he doesn't get towed, is something that's very valuable, and that creates an experience for them that's very relevant. So putting all this together allowed us to create an app that's gotten tremendous result. Last year was the first year we were implemented in the whole city of Montreal. We've gotten more than 150,000 downloads, and 25 million queries to our servers for eight snowstorms in the winter. Um, to conclude, basically, using these three pillars of a good quality app, being design that's simple, uh, experience that's relevant and contextual, and push notifications to be able to really communicate directly and efficiently with citizens, uh, you can give citizens access to complex data, may they be for snow removal, 
or any other type of problem in a city. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks. Now, um, we have about 10 minutes to uh, deal with so some questions. In fact, we only have one question, but if you want to ask something else, please, uh, it's, your, it's your turn. Well, the question that we have is for Hugo Zaragoza, that is here. Uh, it said, um, are the councils really using the power of social media to listen, not only to manage the major reputation? Well, if, if they were all using it, we would be a very rich company. So it's, it's very early days. We're a small company. We're trying to convince cities to, to use us to, to understand. And I tell you that I think that the, the few clients that we have in this area are sincerely trying to understand uh, people and not to push the propaganda in, for the major because there are very good methods to do that in other ways. And listening to social media, it's a complex uh, process. And if you're just trying to win uh, an election, there are other methods I think that are much more effective. So they're really trying to cope with the opinion, whether it's for tourism, for policy, or for actual services that they are pushing out, they're trying to understand a little bit. And cities like Barcelona, they spend a lot of money in traditional methods, like polling, for example. They spend a lot of money asking people by the phone and on the streets about their opinion. So this is just a, a much cheaper alternative. It doesn't replace, but it combines with traditional methods of understanding uh, people's opinions. Uh, there, there are many today. OK, thank you. Uh, I have some other questions. Uh, basically, I, I wonder how to involve the citizen. Because we're talking about sophisticated technologies, complex data, and so on. And we, we imagine that uh, everyone is like, like you. But the average citizen is, in general terms, maybe less informed and less willing to use technology. So how to break this barrier? How to involve citizens? to this kind of uh, processes. I don't know who wants to answer me. Some, someone, yes? Rick? Yeah, I think, is this on? Yeah. I, I, um, I think one of the main things when you're creating new technology and you wanna, you wanna solve a problem is, is to make sure that the, um, the solution that you're creating has an adoption time that is so little that it takes, it's easier for them to open the app and get the information right away and to have to learn the app. Because if they have to learn a new technology, they'll never take the time to invest and to, to get using these new technologies. They'll keep on doing whatever they're doing, even though it's less efficient in one time, uh, over time, I mean. The first time, they're going to not want to put that investment. So for us, it's about creating a tool that when you open it right away, you get the information. And that's really translated into results. And we've seen that um, solutions that are complicated that require long signups and logins and all that don't really work. So I think in order to break the barrier, you give a solution to a problem, and you make that solution more simple to use the first time that people use it. OK. The well, second question is, uh, in this case, oh, let me see, for Alan Vork, uh, you're here. Uh, how a smart city, in your case especially, contributes to the competitiveness of a country? Yeah, a bit complicated question. It comes from Estonia, that is a small country, you know? Yeah, Estonia is a very small country. <laughs> um, yeah, of course, smart city. What does it mean, smart city? Smart city is not technology. Smart city is, um, is for people, and, and that's my slogan here as well. Smart city is out for people, and, and a smarter is, uh, city, uh, the better life is supposed to be for the, for the citizens and, and also for quests. So, so of course... Um, if you put this into correlation, the better life you have, the more competitive this, this is how it is. Okay. And my last question, I don't know whether they have another one, but in any case, this last one from my side is for uh, Hugo Zaragoza. And the question is, I'm really amazing about uh, artificial intelligence and what's coming. How it will impact to smart cities and the life of uh, citizens, in your opinion? Well, that's a... It's a very difficult question, but uh, I think it, it will impact in many ways, uh, and, and they're very hard to predict. I think we're not very good at predicting the future. But uh, the overall theme is that machines were used traditionally to do certain things, 
and that was mostly dealing with numerical data, uh, you know, sort of physical models, that kind of thing, and databases, traditional relational databases, and that we've been doing this for the last uh, more than 50 years, and we, we know what that means. Uh, what artificial intelligence brings, and the promise was there since the 50s, but it seems that now it's going to deliver finally, is that a lot of processes that we thought were human only are going to become just routinary machine processes. So for example, uh, things like visual recognition uh, are now trivialized by machines. So your camera now picks up the faces and nobody gets, goes like, oh my God, you know, this is normal. So uh, the same with text. So before text was the realm of humans, the machines did not interact. Uh, we're now starting to, the computers can understand more and more human text, spoken and written, and so processes that were uh, triage, filtering, and things like that that were only for humans are now becoming, uh, they can be done by machines. So that means they can be done very fast and very cheap, and so they open up new opportunities. Th that's the general answer, but I don't have a very good answer. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay, then um, I have uh, a couple of minutes to summarize, uh, to wrap up the conclusions. We have seen a lot of things, uh, Snapchats of uh, a lot of things from different cities in the world. I think the, the most important conclusion for me is that we, we are in a, in a specific moment of the history, we have exponential technologies in our hands. We can use that from the corporate side to increase the competitiveness of, of our firms, but also from the city side to increase the quality of life of our citizens. We are doing that, and uh, we have several examples, very nice examples of how to uh, take profit of social media, for instance, to increase the intelligence of a body that is called a city, but is a body, organic body. How to use that to, I would say, prevent or anticipate or mitigate the effects of disasters. How to do that in order to increase the quality of tourism. Uh, how to do that to remove the snow in the streets. So there's a lot of applications uh, the only limit is imagination. I imagine, I imagine that uh, in city councils could be a very good um, work to try to imagine how can I extract all the possible value of these technologies to the service of citizens. I think it's a very good challenge. And in the next years, probably, I expect here also in, in Barcelona, we'll see more and more and more results and we'll discuss a lot of more uh, success cases like that, like those. Uh, thank you very much. We finished a little bit before. Thank you very much for your uh, discipline in time. Thank you.